This is Kate Norby from Rob Zombie's The Devil's Rejects, and you are listening to Without Your Head. Welcome to the Station of Decapitation Without Your Head. I'm Nasty Neal. And I'm Heather Mama Crazy Markham. Yes, and we're joined tonight by Nathan Forrest Winters, and it's a pleasure to have you here on the show. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be on the show. Excellent. Um, so, uh, first of all, tell us what uh, We Are Their Voice is. We Are Their Voice is um, it's a grassroots type organization that I'm, I'm getting off the ground. Uh, it's, it's only been basically in conception for maybe four months at this point, but something that I've had kind of in the back of my mind for at least 20 years now that I wanted to do. Um, it's just now coming to fruition as far as, uh, the ideas coming together and, and finding where to start. So Mm -hmm. it's, it's going to be a combination of, of a non, I eventually will become a nonprofit. Um, and I'll be doing a speaking tour, hopefully, uh, sometime early summer, late spring next year. Um, just to go to, you know, key and pertinent venues and, and speak out and, and raise awareness and educate people on, um, you know, finding a solution for this and, and having a safe place for victims and survivors to go um, is, is really the key to that aspect of this. Mm-hmm. Well, why now? Um, because uh, you said you were something you were thought about for 20 years and you also have the documentary in the works. What was it about now? Is it the right time to uh, meet the right people? Um, to be honest with you, it's been, you know, my life has been kind of, at one point, you know, it was like I just wanted to live my own life. Uh, that's why mm-hmm. I kind of didn't, I shied away from acting and wanting to have anything to do with that industry. Um, at 16, I started writing music, and that was really where my passion was. And so, that was that's where my pursuit was was more um becoming you know finding my own niche in the tree of songwriters and and um so that's what i've been pursuing and and you know but it's always been there and then i had a family i was married for close to 10 years and and you know having having a family really put everything on the back burner and so um the time was just right now and and after connor got a hold of me a few months ago and we started talking about doing the the documentary and stuff. Um, the main that that really just like opened my eyes. Okay, maybe the iron is just red hot right now. And and riffing with Connor really started to give me these ideas um, of of how this could this could happen and, and how this could actually be um, something that is gonna is gonna take place. I mean, I, I couldn't find it's like the way to describe it is these ideas I've had for 20 years have only grown, but it started with the one pebble and I somehow lost track of that one pebble that would start it. And mm-hmm. so that's kind of what's happened now is I've, I've rediscovered that, that pebble and how to do all these things and what, what is the best route to take to get to there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, I was ahead. just going to say, you know, I, I think this is a great, Thing. And especially, you know, doing this nonprofit and being able to go out and speak to other people about this and what happened to you. Um, one thing that I've always believed is that, you know, those things that we've been through, the bad things and things like that, you know, not only can we can they make us stronger sometimes, but we can take them and use those experiences to go out and help other people. You know, Absolutely. and I think that's great that that's what you're doing with this and with the documentary and everything. And I totally commend you for that. That's awesome. Thank you. I agree. I mean, the, one of the ways that I've always looked at it is I didn't ask for all this attention. You know, it's mm-hmm. nothing that I've ever thought out. I've never gone out and looked for reporters to do interviews. I've never looked, you know, I mean, if anything, Connor was one of many uh, offers all before him I've turned down for one reason or another because more often than not they wanted me to compromise my moral standing or they wanted me to somehow sell out you know other victims and survivors of this and I, I just won't fucking do that that's not where I'm at with it period yeah. um, 
you know, but the way Connor's approach was so genuine and fresh to me, um, on top of everything else, like what's led up to this in my life, because I mean, truthfully, like most of this, these ideas started really, um, coming to me when I was protesting powder. And again, mm -hmm. um, I didn't think that out. Uh, someone from the Associated Press got a hold of me um, and let me know that, yeah, powder was produced by, uh, by a subsidiary of Disney and, and that whole story. And so when, when that happened, I was basically in this whirlwind of like, you know, thinking of the press like a wood chipper, you know, and they kind of just drew me in, chewed me up and spit me back out uh, when they were done with me. But what that did was it, it put me in touch with other people all over the country and world that are advocating against child abuse and, and how much good people are out there doing. And I wanted to be, I wanted to be a part of that since I was 20 years old. And, um, <clears throat> again, it's just, you know, the, the chain of events throughout my life have, were not conducive until now in my life. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. No, it totally. And, Totally makes sense. Um, you know, especially with, you know, when powder came out and it was a subsidy of Disney, you know, that was making it, of course, people are like, oh, let's, you know, it's, it's Disney, you know, how we can yeah. just totally go after that. You know, they would have just used you as a, an attack tool, you know, and, right. uh, that's, you know, that's great that you held tight to your morals, that you weren't just going to be used as a tool for the media, you know, and to be able to be used against them, you know, that's, that's right, great. Right, right. I mean, that's been my standing all along, is I'm not here to um, personally attack Victor's work, um, but, and here's the truth. When, when I was 12 years old, I wrote Victor a letter, and in that letter, I said to him, that if I ever found out that he had an opportunity or was doing this to another child, I would be there to stop him every time. And that's a promise I intend to keep. And, and that's really where, you know, my whole intention lies is to keep this from happening to any other kids. It has nothing to do with the man working or the films that he makes. It has to do with his intention and what he's doing and, and how he's constantly going back to having some sort of, you know, having children involved in one shape or another. And, and that I won't stand for, you know, mm -hmm. nope. And uh, he's when, never come, oh, I'm sorry, on. go ahead. I was just um, going to say, uh, he, when you sent the, uh, the letter, did he ever reply to that? And have you ever had no. any, uh, actual interaction with him uh, since then? No, absolutely not. He's never come no, forward and he, apologized or anything. And showed any Never. remorse for what he did. Never once. That's just sickening. Nope. Sorry. In I'm fact, a mother. Way, from what so Connor, this makes Connor it read me even and... more, more gut wrenching for me, you know, uh, knowing there's so many people out there like this and so many people getting away with it. And, um, you know, that's what makes us so much more powerful that you are taking a stand and you are doing something about this because there are so many people out there and so many children out there that this is happening to, you know, that don't know yeah. or parents that don't know that this is going on or if they do know, they don't know what to do. Yeah. Or, I mean, even in it, like, especially in this industry or people of power, that are committing these things, you know, these families are given hush money or they're threatened mm -hmm. to the point where, where they feel like protecting their family is of, of more important than fighting these, these monsters out there themselves, you know, and I can understand that. I, I mean, I can completely sympathize with that, but at the same token, for me, the way that I look at it, and this is just a natural kind of, uh, way of life or philosophy for me, for me is that to live in fear or to allow your fears to dictate or make your decisions for you is, is unforgivable as a, as an adult or a parent. And it's mm -hmm. completely the backwards um, example to be setting for our children, you know, and that's, yeah. that's where the name we, that's where the name we are, their voice is derived from because these victims, these survivors have been silenced for one reason or another. And, and that's what I want to be for them. Until they mm -hmm. find their voice, I will be that voice. I will be the one to stand up. You know, they, they, they say that it takes one person to make a change. And 
if, if I need to be that one person right now, I will be. And, um, you know, for me, I have no fear. There's nothing they can take away from me because as long as I utilize the time that I have to make a change, someone will see that and, and want to want to step in line and, and fight this too. Mm -hmm. When you were 12 and you came out, um, about this, uh, did they offer you anything not to, not to say, or, or to your parents not to say anything, or were they not really given a chance? Did you tell your mom? And it they, weren't given a, they weren't given a chance at all. Mm -hmm. um, we had just finished wrapping uh, shooting Clown House. And this was something that my mom had kind of been bugging me about for probably the better part of a year. Um, but on the set of Clown House, it was just like out of control. Like some of the, the cast and, and the crew, not necessarily the cast, but one of the members of the cast and some of the members of the crew had gone to my mom and said, like, you know, the way Nathan sits on Victor's lap in between takes and just their interaction is just something's not right. And it kind of confirmed all these suspicions and, and, and feeling fears that my mother had had. And she just pressed harder and harder and harder until I just finally broke down one day. And I, and I started telling her some of the things that had been going on for, you know, several years. And, uh, within a few days, Victor had, was arrested. Yeah. Had she not seen you interact with Victor before that in the same way? Um, she had, um, but I come from like, you know, a family, a very big family that that's, very supportive and loving and, and affectionate, you know, and Victor at that point had been like, you know, in our family for almost six years at that point. So, you know, it wasn't an odd necessarily thing for him to give me a hug or right. for me to kiss him on the cheek when he left or something. Cause that's something I would have done with my uncle or my auntie or, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Because at that point, I mean, the thing about these, these pedophiles, someone like Victor, um, is that they not only do they groom the child, but they groom the families too. They're master manipulators and they will take the time to make sure that they have the trust of the parents and family and the love and trust above all else of the child. That way they can get whatever they want out of them. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's definitely how Victor operated. Yeah. You know, it took, it took the better part of a year before any of the abuse really started to take place was, mm -hmm. was the better part of a year of, of that grooming process. Mm -hmm. wow. how, how did he even come into contact with you and, and your mom? Um, he worked at a daycare center that oh, one God. of my mother's, yeah, yeah, uh, <laughs> that one of my mother's um, friends, her, her daughter went to that daycare center and he was working on a project um, called Goblin's Gold and he needed somebody to help make props and my mom is like, artistically just gifted she can make just about anything and so her friend said well you know i know this woman rebecca she can make anything and and i'll get you in contact with her and so my mom ended up making props for that that film he was working on and um you know eventually it turned into like victor like oh you guys are swamped you know the kids are fighting you want me to take nathan for the night you guys have a night off kind of thing and and he became my babysitter and you know within a year or so those nights turned into oh i'll just take nathan for the weekend we're gonna go see a movie and i'm gonna take him to an amusement park or something like that you know mm -hmm. well when did the when did it come up that he was gonna you know uh have you in a movie um that was i believe i was about 10 or so 10 ish so it'd been like three or four years that we'd known each other um and he'd worked on projects and when he started doing something in the basement, uh, writing the script, he had everything together. I, I literally, I had to beg him to let me audition for it because he kept saying he didn't want me to audition because he didn't want me to have hurt feelings if I wasn't any good. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I convinced him to let me audition anyway. And so I think there's like 19 or other 20 other kids that auditioned and I ended up, you know, winning the, the starring role for that. Yeah. But I think originally Brian McHugh, Brian McHugh, Jeffrey from Clown House was originally maybe supposed to have that spot. And I kind of beat him out uh, with my audition for it. So, um, but Brian, uh, Brian yeah. McHugh, Brian McHugh oh, co-starred in something in the basement as well. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of your co-stars, I know Sam Rockwell was in it and I believe it was his debut movie. Now, has he uh, ever come out and talked about did 
he ever see anything? You know, has he ever talked about anything he might have seen or um, what his opinion of the whole situation has been? No, not at all. Um, Sam, if you want my opinion, and again, this is only my opinion Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. from my experience and and my speculation, um, Mm -hmm. is that Sam is this kid from New York. He was 18 at the time. Came out to the east, to the West Coast to try to make his his break and uh, get his break and and ended up getting this role in Clown House. He was stoked about it. He was a great guy. He was always really nice to me um, and real friendly. And then when this shit hit the fan, he was just like fuck that and focused solely and distancing himself from that so he could focus on and making a name and getting a career going. You know, so I think you know. I mean, at some point in my life, I was kind of pissed. At another point, I was hurt. You know, at this point, I'm I'm more understanding of where he's coming from, and uh, you know that he didn't want. I mean, most, he's like most people; they don't want to have nothing to do with this. You know, yeah. most anybody that Connor's contacted that was originally involved in Clown House, they don't want to touch it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you think now, with um, now there's all this stuff coming out now, like the Harvey Weinstein thing. And there's all these people in the entertainment industry that are, are speaking out. Um, do you think that he might come out now and say something? Because it's, it's like every day, like, I mean, just today I happen to be going through the news and it's like almost every other article I was seeing or anything I was watching, it was just like, one person after another after another, people are coming out and talking about the sexual abuse in the entertainment industry, which it it's horrifying. It's you know it is horrifying. Is it something we didn't know about? No, we've all known about this stuff has been going on for a long time, but people are finally feeling. I don't know. They have to do something about comfortable. it. Yeah, they're finally at a point where they're like, enough is enough. We're coming out about it. We're going to name names. This has got to stop. You know, and whether it actually is going to end up stopping is a whole nother story. But I think it was, you know, hitting some people that are at the top and confronting them. Um, mm-hmm. That was a big step. You know, absolutely. So, um, so I hope uh, I think, more I think people... what it really is, is, is <clears throat> I mean, to be honest with you, and this is not me, like, in any way tooting my own horn, okay? But the oh, fact no. is, is that, you know, be prior to Powder, um, really, no one, no one had to come forward. No man had come forward, and especially not the way that I did. Um, when I came forward and spoke out about Victor during, during the Powder scandal, it was like, you know, here's this young 20-year-old guy. Um, out here holding his head high without any shame whatsoever or fear and mm-hmm. talking about this um, openly. And I think mm-hmm. that really set the stage. Um, you know, I mean, it was, it was just, it was just, just unbelievable how much response I got from, from people out there that are, you know, in their forties, fifties saying like, you know, thanks to your strength, I'm, I'm finding my voice now, you know, after all these years, I'm remembering what happened to me as a kid and I'm ready to start bringing it to the surface and processing it and dealing with it in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. And that's really the key to a victim becoming a survivor is being able to find your voice and realize that you have absolutely no responsibility or any reason to be carrying this, this, you know, shackle of shame behind you. And, and that's Mm -hmm. really what damages these kids the most is the secret, this dirty little secret. And then once you start telling the secret, it's not so dark and dirty anymore. And then once you start telling and you realize that, then the next thing you know, you've got all these other people out there that are saying, look, I went through the same thing. And that one becomes, you know, many. And, and that's really what's going to empower all of us is once we start banding together and, and calling out our victimizers and, and saying, look, this is, you know, this is not mine to carry anymore. You know, that's for me, that was, that was my transition from victim to survivors. When I realized that I am not going to carry this shame anymore. This is not mine. Victor can have it back. It's Mm -hmm. his, not mine. 
When did that happen? I assume you weren't always able to, you know, uh, talk about it without any uh, uh, shame or any, you know, terrible feelings about it. Well, truthfully, I went from 12 to 18. I went to therapy. I, I was that was part of the settlement was that that I would go to therapy from 12 to 18. So this is something in a way I was I was kind of conditioned for. Um, and what that six years of therapy really taught me was that talking about things, I'm a huge supporter of, of therapy anyway. Like I think, I think talking about things and having open communication about your feelings is um, an elemental key to, you know, really being progressive human beings and becoming better than you were yesterday, you know, kind of people. And um, <clears throat> So for me, when, when powder came out, it was just a natural thing. It was just natural for me to go out and speak about it because at that point I've had, I'd had to speak about it so much that it was, there really, I, I learned to detach myself from that part of it to where I can speak about it as if I'm talking about the weather, you know, there's real, no emotional deta- uh, attachment to it. Um, and that's really, I think what shocks people is that, you know, that I am able to detach my emotion from it and just talk about it openly um, <clears throat> without any reservation. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just want to uh, let everyone know that our other uh, partner here on the show, Troy, is uh, is now joined us. Yep. yep. Hello, I was just terrible back Troy. And How's yeah. everybody doing? Yeah. Hey, Troy. Good, so, good, good. How's it going? Um, I'm good. Thank you. What? What what was the last straw where you decided to actually, uh, you know, tell your mom what was going on? Um, I mean, I'll be honest with you. I was pretty sick of Victor's shit, you know, like the truth is, is as it went on and progressed and as I got older, um, you know, it was like I was just a piece of meat and I just. I, at that age, I didn't really even know what that was. I just know, I just knew that I didn't like the way that he made me feel about myself. Mm -hmm. And, um, I just, my mom raised me, my parents raised me to be very, um, honest and, and, uh, open. And, you know, I just, I couldn't lie to her anymore. You know, I mean, I, I just, I couldn't lie to her anymore. And I wanted her off my back. I wanted her to stop, you know, pushing on me so hard about it. And, you know, I didn't realize at that point what the repercussions were going to be. I didn't know that I was going to, like, lose my career as an actor. I didn't know that, you know, I had no idea. I was very naive at 11 years old, you know. Um, But really, it was just, you know, something inside of me. Yeah, you were 11. What do you expect? You know? Yeah. But something inside me just knew that it was wrong. Um, at that point, you know, I mean, at six, I had that feeling in my gut, like, you know, but I trusted Victor above, you know, I mean, maybe not as much as I trusted my mother, but I, I trusted Victor and I loved Victor a lot. Um, you know, I was, I was, a, I was being abused by my stepfather at home at that time, um, you know, he's going through some things and I, it was like, I had an abusive home life and, and that's what these, these predators look for is they look for victims. You know, at that point I was already walking around with a victim sign over my head. So, um, you know, I was like a textbook case for, for Victor. And mm-hmm. when he came into my life, all of a sudden here's this positive male, uh, role model in my life that wanted to treat me like I was special, you know, and, I was starving for it. And so, you know, I didn't realize when I told my mom exactly what was going to happen, but that was, you know, pretty, that was pretty devastating too, because now the person that treated me like I was special and that he loved me was all of a sudden now he's gone too. Mm. You know, that's uh, that's really, that's the case with most kids. It really is. mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Now before, everything happened with you had Victor, um, had, had he assaulted anybody else or abused anybody else? Had he been prosecuted or had there been allegations or anything like that prior? I mean, Um, or even not that the, not nothing concrete, nothing that can Mm -hmm. be proven, you Mm -hmm. know, but there are other people that that 
I, kind of all I can say about is it. I wasn't the, well, I wasn't the only kid that he babysat. I'll just put it that way. <clears throat> yeah. It, you said you knew you didn't, uh, you, you're 12 or 11, so you don't understand like this is going to be in your career and all, and which is understandable. But uh, how did that come about? Like, did you just stop getting roles? Was there someone who just said, you know, you won't work again? Like, yeah. you know, yeah, someone not to told name names. That? Yeah. Not to name names, but uh, basically I was told that I would not work in that industry again. So, when, I mean, when you think oh, in Hollywood. Truth, yeah, in all truth, they did a one time and one time only screening of Clown House for cast and crew in San Francisco. I was the only one not invited. Wow. Well, I don't think Victor was there because he was probably in jail or whatever, but out of the entire cast and crew, I was the only one not invited. That's horrible. Like, especially after everything you went through. Right. You know. mm-hmm. I mean, that was right at the, the, the beginning of puberty for me. You know what I mean? That was a yeah. really tough time <laughs> already. You yeah. Know? And, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, speaking of that, um, I don't know how much of this, this well, I assume you've talked about before, but the, uh, how much does that mess you up going forward with, uh, relationships with, 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 with girls and women? Um, because I assume like it's, when you're, when you're six and everything, um, something might, I don't want to say you enjoyed anything that happened, but at the same time, you're just a physical being. So some things that feel good, just feel good. Right. And so. Does that mess up, um, like, the uh, future when things feel good? Like, does it, is there, like, uh, a confliction? Yeah, of, uh, it, it, messed up, it definitely messed up a lot of my relationships. I went through a, um, a part in my life where I was very, very promiscuous with women. Um, you know, I had something to prove to myself and anybody else that wanted to call me a faggot, you know, mm-hmm. that, that I wasn't a faggot. And, uh, you know, so I was very, very promiscuous. And, um you know, like oral sex has always been an issue for me. You know, it's just, it's always, always been an issue. It still is, Mm -hmm. but, um, it's something that, you know, through trust and, and love and relationship I've, you know, and, and process just working through these things because, you know, I'm not going to allow, I don't want to allow something that someone else has done to Mm -hmm. affect the man I am today. You know, so this is, these are all things that I've had to work towards. Um, but yeah, I mean, and, and for somebody, you know, again, mine is not a typical instance or case in the fact that for one, it's had, um, tons of, uh, uh, public attention. That's, that's mm-hmm. something that's not normal. Um, but also, you know, that, that, um, I went through this there, I went through six years of therapy, you know, a lot of victims don't get that opportunity. Mm-hmm. have six years of learning how to process these things, you know? So for me, it, it that is, a, that's not a norm, you know? Um, but the way that I look at it is it's, it's all led up to my job, which is to stop this on all levels with everything I have, you know? So for me, I look back at it as, as it was all just a part of my um, training to become this advocate against it. Mm-hmm. Um, have you found that it is harder for, for a, a male to come out about it because it, you are going to be, there's going to be the label, Oh, you must be gay or P or kids make fun of you or, or just even the idea that I don't want to tell anybody else that I had sex with, you know, with a man. Yes, definitely. Um, <clears throat> which, you know, I'm not, I'm not downplaying or putting any kind of emphasis on, um, it's, it's more damaging to boys. I'm not saying that at all. Exactly. But I understand. It's hard. It is, it, it's, it is much harder for boys to come forward when they're being abused by a man. Yes, absolutely. Did you, um, did you ever question your own sexuality, you know, after this happened to you? I did up until about, I'd, I'd say about 14 or 15. Um, and I realized that, you know what, like, <laughs> I, I, it's just not there. I, I, I've loved women since I was a little boy. Like I've always loved women. That's, mm-hmm. and I just had to realize that, you know, that that's, it's just not there. I'm, I'm not gay, you know? And, uh, 
but it was still something that was in the back of my mind for many years. It wasn't until my, you know, early twenties that I truly started to like, let that fear or, um, concern die, you know, and just let it lay it to rest and realize that, you know, you know who you are, you, you know, cause I'm, I'm one of those guys, I'm, um, very comfortable with my sexuality, mm-hmm. you know, and my feminine side is developed. I don't have a problem giving hugs to my bros or telling them that I love them. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? That's just, to me, that's a natural thing. Um, <clears throat> and it was differentiating that between a sexual feeling. And that's what I really had to discover was that just because I love my bros or I hug them doesn't mean that I want to have sex with them. Mm-hmm. And finding that difference was what it took for me to realize that, you know, I don't have anything to, uh, to be beating myself up about here. You know what I mean? Like, you know who you are, Nathan. Mm -hmm. I'm sure um, that therapy had to help a lot. You know, that I'm all about people. Therapy is great. Therapy, 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 you know, um, especially if you've gone something through something like this. I mean, anything. I'm sorry, but we all need people we can talk to, you Mm -hmm. know, um, you know, uh, we had had a question posed. Um, have you seen the uh, the big hashtag Me Too campaign going around? Um, and it's it's about women who have been abused. And I was wondering what your thoughts were, considering that um, you know, if you find it disrespectful or shaming um, towards men who have been assaulted and abused no not at all and i i honestly i don't think that it's something that needs to be there no, there doesn't need to be any division between men mm-hmm. and women in this um abuse is abuse is abuse period mm-hmm. whether you're a man or you're a woman whether you're an adult or you're a child abuse is abuse and i think mm-hmm. that banding together is elements to putting a stop to it there doesn't need to be division you know um, I've known just as many women that have been sexually abused as I know men. And mm-hmm. I'll tell you what, it damaged the, it, it, the damage isn't any different. So there doesn't need to be any division, you know, and I commend anyone that wants to come forward and call out their victimizer. Mm-hmm. I, I think that's, I think it's, it's commendable and, and I'm proud of all of them. And, you know, I look forward to, to making this less of a, you know, like this, this just horrible fucking topic that no one wants to discuss. You know, it's like this, this elephant's been in the room all this time and everybody just wants to turn a blind eye and a deaf ear to it. Well, it's time for all of us to get up together and go, okay, Mr. Elephant, you had a nice run, buddy, but it's time to come out to the front of the room where everybody gets to look at you and we can all talk about finding a solution. You know, I mean, that's where I'm at with it. Yep, I absolutely agree. I mean, and with the, my t- or Me Too campaign, I'm like, if anything, I'm like, at least if anything, it started a dialogue. If we can at least start a dialogue about this, what's going on, and like with all abuse, you know, whether it's male, right. female, right. what have you, you know, if it just starts as a dialogue, because I mean, there were women hating on women during all of this and it's just like no this is not something that we need to hate on each other for this is something right. that is so important that is happening every eight seconds every eight seconds you know yep. in the in the world you know this is not something that should be even mildly you know just covered up or no let's not let's just not look yeah let's just not look at that over there it's like no that's not okay you know this is something that we need to take care of we need to look at we need to discuss you know and i i'm so glad that you guys are putting together this documentary and especially um you know this foundation like this this is us is things like this are vital Getting this communication out into the public is vital. Getting out to schools, elementary schools, Definitely. junior highs, See, things like that. You're right Letting on track. Letting these kids know. Letting these kids know that if this stuff is happening, I mean, you might hear it from your teachers or, you know, maybe from 
at home, okay, now if somebody touches you in the boo-boo, then you tell your parents. It's like, you know, but if you hear it from somebody that it's actually happened to, it is 10 times more powerful, you know, that right. this is not okay, you know. So, um, yeah, thank you for having a voice and, and shouting it from I, the rooftop. Thank you. I appreciate rooftops. that. Yeah. Yeah. And working with Connor has just been, I mean, the kid's brilliant, you know, and, um, I mean, he's passionate about this and he, you know, I mean, that's really what, what drew me to him when he came to me was like what he wanted to do. And the ultimate, um, end goal was so close to mine that the only answer was yes, let's do this together. Um, because really that's what we're hoping to do is, is through our strength and our voice, um, others will, will find their, their own. And, and the more people that are willing to find their voice and to speak out about this, um, I mean, it, it goes right back to, right back to my soundbite, which is the more light we shed on these darkest of crimes, the fewer shadows there will be for them to hide. And that's really Absolutely. what needs to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, how widespread do you think the, this is in Hollywood in particular? As far as, uh, pedophilia. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> that's a tough question, but I think, you know, especially with what we've seen throughout the years, um, I mean, just take a look at like certain, you know, actors or actresses that have had these like blooming childhood, uh, you know, careers. And then as adults just turn to drugs and end up dying you know, or in their 20s. Um, what do you think's making them turn to drugs and, and, and want to recluse this way? And I'm, I'm telling you, it's not because they had this blooming career as a child. It's probably something deep and dark that was going on, um, you know, during their career that had to do with them turning to a life of self-medication. Um, so really, I think that it goes deeper than anybody wants to even admit. Um, but you know what, uh, I'm here to, I'm here to spread the light on it. You know, I, I got no problem going up against any of them or, or speaking out about the truth. You know, I can't, I can't, uh, basically accuse anyone other than Victor at this point, because he's the one that there's concrete proof and evidence of his crimes, mm-hmm. but that's not to say that there isn't plenty written between the lines or plenty of, of the pieces of the puzzle are already put together. People just have to be willing to put the rest of the puzzle together for themselves. And then they'll see how, you know, how much and how deep this really goes. Yeah. Well, I know even, uh, Brian Peck had gone, it was, uh, convicted too. And, uh, it was, uh, it was with actors that he was like, uh, mentoring like young actors. And, uh, I didn't even know, I, I, it's weird cause I had him on the show, but I had no idea about anything about that until recently. Uh, because mm-hmm. with the internet, a lot of this, honestly, I didn't know about Victor Salva till, uh, last, like a couple of years ago. Uh, you know, because with the internet, uh, these things now you, you're, are out there. But, right. Uh, <clears throat> uh, did you, do you know anything about Brian Peck? Um, just, just a little bit that he was with Nickelodeon and he, he like molested a couple kids or something. And, um, like recently Connor had me watch an open secret mm-hmm. and that was, that was a great documentary. Um, and, and so, you know, I, again, I commend, I commend these kids and these men that have come forward and, and openly publicly, um, you know, talked about their experience and their abuse. Mm-hmm. Cause it takes you a know, lot, uh, it takes a lot of strength and a lot of, of courage and, and self, will to um not be intimidated by the beast that is hollywood Mm -hmm. and so for anyone that's willing to come forward and and take that on is is in my opinion you know doing fighting the good fight Mm -hmm. you know one person that i mean well especially recently that i've seen speak out has been Corey feldman and mm-hmm. I actually saw him on The View today uh, going at it with Barbara Walters. Um, and he's spoken out 
about, you know, uh, the sexual abuse and stuff and talking about, you know, the drug abuse and drinking and things like that. And he, he blames, you know, the entertainment industry for, uh, Corey Haim, uh, for Mm -hmm. his death, you know, for his alcoholism and his drug addiction, you know? And I think that, you know, that's, that is very true that, you know, it's like, all right, you know, let's feed them this, keep them docile, keep them, you know, in con- mm-hmm. where we can control them, you know, and, you know, and then it becomes like a coping mechanism. You know, it's like Absolutely. everything I went through when I was a child, how can I cope and deal with this drinking and drugs, you know, drinking and drugs right there is a one way to cope with things, you know, it's well, not a when positive you're, when way you're to cope, that- but Right, right. And when you're in that industry, um, Mm -hmm. I mean, that's one of the biggest problems, I think, with child actors. And that whole aspect of Hollywood is, is that, you know, everything is at your disposal. You know, Mm -hmm. whatever and anything, anything and everything you want is right there and is being encouraged. And, and then you got these, these predators out there that are utilizing those things in order to sedate and make their victims, um, you know, easier for them to, to prey on, you know, it's like, it's yeah. like the idea of a date rapist, you know, I mean, what's he, he's going to go out and he's going to get this, this person drunk and, and drop, you know, a, a date rape drug, whatever into their drink. And then, and then once they're, you know, incapacitated, um, rape them, you know, I mean, there's, there's no difference. It's just done, um, in a way to where, you know, these children are, for one, I think they're afraid of, of that, that beast of Hollywood, but also, you know, like, I mean, that was something that Victor used to tell me is like, if you tell anybody, you know, you're not going to see me anymore and you're not going to be able to act anymore. And, Mm -hmm. you know, so again, you know, it's, they're using this against their victims um, to get what they want. It's just a form of manipulation. Um, you know, and so, like I was saying, I, I didn't realize the, the repercussions of this when I told my mom, you know, I had those fears that I wasn't going to act and I wasn't going to see him again. But at the same time, I, I had no idea the gravity of it. You know what I mean? Um, I just I, that's not something I could fathom at 11 years old. Mm-hmm. Now, I know you have you have children um, and I'm assuming that you you've talked to your children about this. Um, how, how did they respond to you telling them about what had happened and, um, what you were doing and like what you're doing now with this project? I I don't know how old your children are. I'm sorry. But, um, um, how did that affect your family life? It's something that the way that I've always dealt with my children as a, as a parent is, um, I speak to them on their level. You know, Mm -hmm. so my oldest gets a more grown up version of what I have to say than say my youngest, Mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that um, I bullshit them at all. It just means Mm -hmm. that, you know, it's age appropriate, you know, what I think that they can comprehend and understand, because that's my intention. If I'm talking to them about something is that I want them to have an understanding. I don't want it to go over their head, you know, um, but, you know, I mean, their real reaction is, is, you know, was sadness. They were sad for their dad that I had to go through that. And, you know, they're, they're really proud of what I'm doing. That's great. Now, That's great if, that you have that support. Um, let's ask you, do, do you hate Victor Salva? I don't hate him. I don't. I hate what he does. Mm-hmm. I hate what he does. I hate the damage he does to children, but I don't hate the man. I don't have, I don't have room in my heart or in my life to hate people. I just don't, I don't, I don't believe that's a solution. I think that is, um, hatred would be a part of the problem, not the solution. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, for, for people who might not understand that, could you explain a little more? And did that ever change? Was there a time you did hate him? Um, you know, I'm not really sure. Did I ever hate him? No, no, I don't think I ever really have. I think that a lot of it has been um, 
I feel sorry for him that he's that fucked up mm-hmm. to be honest with you that he thinks it's what he's doing is okay and that he uh exploits children and the way that he um he, I mean like in clown house you know um Connor and I just watched it and it's like all the little innuendos, all the dialogue, the you know, the boys half naked in their underwear, all those scenes mm-hmm. are exploitation of of his crimes. And that's what I think is sick and twisted. Mm-hmm. And the fact that he thinks that's okay, I I feel sorry for him that he thinks that's okay. Yeah. You know, the, the first few minutes of that, that he, Yeah. So the for the first few minutes of that movie, it's really apparent. I just watched it uh, myself for the uh first time with the knowledge of everything. And just that for those first few minutes, it's like, wow, this is uh it's all right there. I have yeah, not watched you know, it. I actually have not been able to bring myself to watch it. You know, well, within um, the first five minutes within the first five minutes you see all three of us in our underwear and my bare ass within the first five yeah, minutes. Yeah, I heard yeah, and I heard there was a masturbation scene too thrown in there. No, somebody walked yeah. in on somebody masturbating, and I'm just like, yeah, you know, um, I had never, you know, really heard of the movie um, beforehand. Um, and then with everything that's gone on, I was like, do I really want to watch this? Can I yep. really stomach watching this? And, you know, I used to be, I loved the Jeepers Creepers movies. I loved them Mm -hmm. and uh, I I just can't, I can't, I can't watch them anymore. It's just, um, it's not that I didn't like the movies. It's just, I know where they came from. Yeah. And uh, actually, Oh, I was going to say along those lines, there is like a debate uh, within the horror community about uh, separating uh, uh, the man from his art, uh, things like this, Mm -hmm. the art from the man. Um, what are your opinions on someone who decides to like, like Jeepers Creepers or someone who decides to boycott it? Or, uh, do you have any opinion on that? Um, in all honesty, I think that, you know, people have the right to know the truth and, you know, if they still choose to watch his films, that's, that's up to them. I mean, I'm not, I'm not here to tell anybody else how to live or what to watch or what to do with their lives. So that's not mm-hmm. what I'm here for. Um, you know, if they like them, they like them. That's, you know, that's, that's their choice, but I think they have the right to know what they're going into, you know? And, uh, I think that once they know that they might see his films a bit differently than they would have prior. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because I'm actually it, you know, really it's, glad. It's in all of the films. It really is. I was actually really glad to find out about this. Uh, I live in Louisiana and, uh, they had actually scouted, a friend of mine's ranch when they were getting ready to film uh, Jeepers Creepers three. And I had told her about what had happened and everything. And she's just like, I'm so glad I told them no. <laughs> and I'm just yeah. like, yeah, you know, she's like, I would not have wanted anything to do with that at all here, right. you know? And, um, you know, it, it, it is, it's just one of those things. Um, I can live without the movies, you know, that's okay. You know, yeah. uh, that's just my part. That's, that's just my opinion. That's just my part, you know? Right. Um, and that's just how I, I see it for myself, you know, but, but not um, everybody if, sees it that way. I mean, in all truth, exactly. when, when powder came out and I was, I was protesting powder. I, I had several people that came up to me and said, well, you know, I, I'm going to go see the movie just because of this this scandal you know like this is why i'm mm-hmm. going to go see this movie you know i wasn't planning on it before but after hearing what you had to say now i'm going to go see the movie you know so um you know more power to you i mean it, it really has nothing to do with with me you know i'm i'm literally i'm not here to stop the man from working i'm here to stop him from abusing children mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, along those lines do you think a pedophile can be cured i don't in my opinion, I do not believe that. I believe that like a drug addict or alcoholic, perhaps they can learn to not commit these crimes. Mm-hmm. But I, I believe that, you know, it's like someone had said to me at one point, he, he did his time. He went through his treatment program. He's been really rehabilitated. And my response to that was, so 
you can put me in a, a, in a treatment center for 15 months as a heterosexual man and I'll come out gay. Mm -hmm. Because you're it's essentially the same thing. Yeah, you're attracted I to what you're attracted to. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah, with powder, um, I didn't know about this when I saw powder. And, you know, I, I, I like went back and I was thinking about powder and I was just like, wow. You know, there was the naked scene in the shower and a lot of stuff. And I'm like, wow, that was really creepy. You know, going back yeah. and thinking about it, I was like, wow. You know, that that really kind of creeped me out after I found out about everything. You know, um, we actually we do have a little question um, about uh, what you think about children and um, like in the fashion industry, how um like young children are being uh, used in the fashion industry, like for um, photographs, things like that. Um, if that is something that maybe um, arouses child, you know, like I think it's kind of like the sexualizing of children. Probably. Yeah, sexualizing of children. Definitely. Um, uh, to be honest with you, when Victor was arrested. I know that some of the evidence that was uh, recovered, w there were photo albums full of boys posing for underwear ads. Mm. So, mm -hmm. so, you know, and again, his films are kind of a testament to that, that, you know, these are trophies for mm -hmm. other pedophiles to watch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, I have a question. It was because you said it a couple times about, you know, being 11 and you were kind of naive about uh this being the end of your career and everything do you feel if you were a little older and you kind of understood that uh this would you know i wouldn't be able to act i wouldn't be in in this world anymore it could have actually led to you not coming out about it um i don't think so uh i think that it was it, i was going to end up telling my mom one way or another um, cause she wasn't going to let up. And the truth is, is if, if, it, if I had been older, I would have already been discarded by Victor because mm -hmm. as it was at 12, I was getting to be a little too old for him, you know, mm -hmm. like another year or two, maybe at, at the most. Yeah. Uh, do you still have a, do you, what's your relationship uh, like with your mom since this? Um, I love my mom. I'm a, mama, I'm a mama's boy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> I assume it must have been, uh, uh, you know, it must have been awful, obviously, for her. Plus, you know, trusting someone with her son at an early age right. and then finding out what had happened. So, um, what what did you and your mom think when he only had, he only was served for, eight, well, he only did uh, 18 months? Uh, my mom, to this day, is, is really livid about it. Um, you know, she's, I don't know that she's, um, she's let go of all of her guilt yet. Mm -hmm. And I can understand that being a parent. Yeah. Um, you know, it makes me want to cry even thinking about it actually, because, you know, I, I, I forgive my mom. I know that it wasn't her fault either. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's her making that realization. Um, I think that will really allow her to heal from it. But um, she's still she's still fucking pissed, you know. Mm -hmm. When 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 she talks about it, she gets real heated. Mm -hmm. You, you right, said that that it stemmed, it stemmed okay. from her guilt, I you know. Sure. It, you said yeah. you didn't want to stop Victor from from working, um, but on your in your opinion, like how f should he be allowed to make movies, or sh or if he is, should there not be children on the set? What what are your opinions there? So last year I got approached by a production company that um, blew a bunch of smoke up my ass, offered me a bunch of money, said they were going to start a foundation in my name, all this shit. Um, and what they wanted from me in return was to like somehow go publicly and forgive Victor and, and publicly uh, announce that I was not going to cause any waves for Jeepers Creepers 3. Mm -hmm. Um now, the only thing I asked in return was that they have a very strict policy and regiment of 18 and over on their set. 
and they stopped calling me altogether. They didn't even call me to tell me that they weren't going through with Jeepers Creepers 3 anymore. Mm -hmm. Wow. You know, that's all I ask. Is, and that's really, I'm not asking any more than the law is asking because sure. as a convicted child molester and a sex offender, he is not allowed to be around anyone under 18, period. That's against the law. So mm -hmm. all I was really asking of this production company was that they abide the law. And that was too much for them. Mm. Why so do you think really it is? My uh, stance is. Yeah. That's well, my why, stance. Yeah. He can make whatever movies he wants as long as no one under 18 is around him at all, ever, period. He can make yeah. whatever movie he wants. Mm -hmm. well, why do you think it, it was like uh, so accept accepting for him to come back and make movies and continue to make movies? I'm sorry, say that one more time. Why do you think like uh, <clears throat> producers and, and whoever were so accepting of him to come back and make movies and still make movies today? Honestly, I, I, I don't really know. I mean, he's got some talent, but I don't personally, I don't think it necessarily his movies are that great. So I'm not really sure. Um, you know, I don't know why he's been so uh, sheltered and protected from his crime. And why people have, have covered up for him time and time again. And why, you know, like on Powder, some of the interviews prior to it coming out in the press about what happened with me, um, there were reports of children and dogs running all over the set of Powder. Like the cast and crew were bringing their kids to the set. Uh -huh. Oh, God. You know, so... Um, you know, again, I, again, I'm not here to keep him from working. I'm here to keep that from happening, sure. you know, and that just seems to be too much for Hollywood to abide by the law and keep this, this, um, you know, pedophile away from being able to victimize any more children. Mm -hmm. They just keep giving them the opportunity and everybody just thinks, you know, like they just don't even talk about it. It's all okay. So, um, I want to mention too the we mentioned the documentary, but the name is uh, Pure Eternus, and uh, you guys uh, I don't know if we're supposed to say you guys are uh, uh, filming now, I believe. And um, what what are your hopes to accomplish uh, being part of it? Um, really, just like I was saying, I uh, in my opinion, because it's thirty years old. I mean, this he was arrested and convicted thirty years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay, so why is it that people? are still so um, interested in this? Why is there still this level of commitment of, of these people out there um, to knowing what really happened? And, and in my opinion, what I've, I've concluded is that me personally, I don't like being lied to. I don't like being fed a, um, you know, a plate of shit, basically. And that's all that people out there that want to know have been getting other than the little, you know, little bits and pieces of, you know, when I've done a couple interviews or when that all happened with powder, but again, that shit's been buried. You know what I mean? So I really think the interest is that people want the truth. They're tired of being fed the lies and the bullshit and having to choke them down because when you're being lied to, you know, you're being lied to. I mean, your gut tells you like this person is feeding me a line of shit. And people are sick of that. So, you know, for me, I think through me giving people the truth of, of my side and having that available is going to open doors for so many other victims out there to find that, that voice and to find their, the, the path to their healing. And that's what I want to see ultimately is I want to see um, a ripple effect that's going to help you know countless other victims to become survivors and to start speaking up and and again you know coming together to stop this from happening on all levels and that's really what i want out of this documentary is i want a chance i want to utilize the chance that i've been given by this being such a public um ca case um and make the most of it and to help as many many people as i possibly can with it mm -hmm. Um, since, since you've been on, uh, online, have you had a lot of people, uh, 
uh, come to you to uh, either say you've been uh, you've helped them come out and talk about things or, you know, what's that been like for you? It's encouraging. Um, the support has been has been overwhelming and and in a very positive way. It gives me strength to know that, um, you know, cause we all have our days. We all have those, those doubts and those naysayers in our head, um, telling us, you know, that we can't do this or we don't have the strength or, you know, we all have those days. And, um, so having that, that level of support and, and knowing that by me doing this, I'm helping others to accept their place as as victims and to find their their path to to being a survivor that to me is very empowering and very very encouraging because that's ultimately again that's what i really want out of this is to utilize what to utilize the attention this has gotten and turn it into a positive mm-hmm. oh, um you mentioned you guys just watched clown house is it is that the first time you've seen it in a what um, when was the last time you saw it before, uh, just recently? Um, it was probably several years ago. Um, when my kids were younger, um, uh, my two daughters wanted, wanted to watch the movie their dad starred in. So, sure. uh, I think that probably the last time I watched it was with them and I didn't watch the whole thing. You know, I kind of just made jokes or, you know, snuck up behind them and scared them or something. Because you know <laughs> uh-huh. <I mean>? right. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm just like that. I'd love to scare my kids. Um, <laughs> they love it too. You know, it's it, it made them stronger, and they they they're horror film fans too because of that. You know, I remember at one point um, they had a girlfriend. They had one of their little friends stay the night for the weekend, and I let them rent Blair Witch Project. And they're like in eighth grade, and I think fifth grade or something like that at that point. <laughs> And so after the movie, they all went outside and played. Well, I secretly snuck and went and got some sticks out of our woods and tied them all together <laughs> and then hung them from their ceiling. <laughs> and then waited for them to go in their room. And I'm like looking at my ex-wife and I'm like going, okay, three, two, one, blood curdling, blood curdling scream on cue. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty awesome. So, uh, well, uh, what are some of your favorite horror movies? Um, I was just talking to Connor about this. I love Blair Witch Project. I think that movie was brilliant. Um, it scared the shit out of me in the theater. I walked out going like, "Was that real?" Or I mean, what did I just <laughs> watch? Yeah, you know what I mean, like, what did I just see? And um, you know, as as a kid, I think Jaws is probably one of the scariest movies of all time. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, because it relied so much on on like placing this very common fear, but it's something that like to this day, if I'm swimming in an open body of water, I'm like, what the fuck is swimming beneath me? You know what I mean? Like <laughs> to this day, that movie scares me. And I think that's really the power that Jaws had, you know, and I, I like the classics. I'm a fan of Rob Zombie stuff. I like his stuff a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I live near where uh, Jaws was shot. Uh, I'm on, on Cape Cod, which is very close to the uh, to the island. Mm-hmm. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, here in the, on the Facebook page, uh, Tarvo from Germany wants to know uh, how can people uh, reach you online? How what's the best way to follow you online? Um, I have a fan page on Facebook. It's just it's Nathan Forrest Winters. And uh, you also have the Nathan's mm-hmm, yeah, group. What's uh, what what uh, what's a Nathan's group? Um, Oh, Nathan's group is just something I started today. Um, and it was really one of the biggest things was to help promote this interview. Um, you know, cause I'm, I'm not the best at social networking sure. again. Like I've been working, I've been working se- for several years on producing my own music. And, um, so that's something that kind of passed me by. So I'm just now like learning, okay, this is how, you know, you use hashtags. This is how you, you know, to use social media, to, to right? Promote, right? Uh, so I'm like, yeah. totally if you understand. Ask me seven months, ask me six months ago, what a hashtag it was, I was like, I don't know. Somebody get in that Amsterdam? I don't know. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I was completely a Twitter illiterate. <laughs> right. I, I don't even know if I have a Twitter. I, you know, like I don't. I'm like asking somebody. They're like, you need to start a Twitter. I'm like, well, what am I supposed to do on a Twitter? Tweet. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <Sweet. Yeah. laughs> I'm like, wait, I use too many. 
too many letters. How am I supposed to do this? Mm -hmm. (laughs) uh, Exactly. And Pierre Eternus, uh, you can follow that on Facebook.com slash The Babysitter Movie. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, it still it still has the babysitter in the title. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's like yeah. the subtitle now. Yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Is there still a GoFundMe page to help uh, uh, fund anything? There is, there is. Um, that's at GoFundMe dot com backslash. Uh, I believe it's we dash the letter R dash their dash voice. Yeah. And I do have a suggestion for that. Uh, you should add some. You should add some incentives. So, like, uh, if people donate X amount, they, I don't know. You think of different uh, things you can give out: autograph, photo, or, or something like that. It, uh, I think, would help it out. Yeah, we've been working on that. Actually, we we have been. You know, we've got some shirts made up. Um, so we're definitely working on that aspect of it. Very cool. People and love that- swag. Yeah. Of course. Yeah, they love the swag. People huh? <laughs> <Even> love swag. <laughs> I just love that word. <laughs> yeah, you just got yeah, all the right. lingo. That's what you need. Right. Yeah. He's learning hashtag and swag. Hashtag yeah. and swag. <laughs> right. Right. Shit You're going to go back and listen to this day. and take notes. <laughs> what was that one exactly. word that swag? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, let us know. Let us know about. Let us know about your music. What kind of music uh, yeah. uh, do you play? Um, I, do, I do just about anything, but it's, it's rooted um, with acoustic, like alternative feel to it. Um, I just, I, I've been doing it for so long that there, there's, you know, like lately I've been getting into more like electronic dubstep kind of stuff um, and oh. wanting to meld those, meld those genres with acoustic music but have like that super growly, you know, wobble bass on top of, you know, acoustic music with like heavy metal drums and, and, you know, like, so, but, uh, you know, basically the way I look at it is anything I write, I want to be able to pick up my acoustic guitar and play it at any time, you know, and that's why I really, I root everything with that, that aspect of it is I want to be able to perform it. You know, it's, it's not something that, um, you know, I think that, that musicians or artists should not have songs that are strictly album songs. I think, you know, they should be able to figure out a version of every song to play it live if they're ever in that spot, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. But you can, I mean, my music's available. There's, there's free downloads. I think I got like 26 or so songs on reverb nation. Um, The name of my project. Yeah. It's called the, the seven stone. The, the T in the is, is the number seven. That's how you, can differentiate from anybody else but so it's yeah the, it's um reverbnation.com backslash the seven stone cool. and that has See, links there's to another YouTube and another stuff. swag another swag for yep. the uh go fund me <laughs> right there yep, there it is <laughs> swagalistic <laughs> swagalistic <laughs> yeah now you're gonna start combining stuff it'll be like a swag tag and things like that <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's brilliant. I think you just came up with something. So uh copyright that. <laughs> <laughs> is there is there any uh, part of you that would be interested in possibly uh doing like traditional acting again since uh since you're doing the, the documentary? Um there is a part of me. I mean, I can't, I can't deny it. I can't lie. Um, it would just have to be the right project. It'd have to be the right people to be working with. Um, cause I'm, you know, I've, I've been working <clears throat> on my own. I've been in several bands on and off, you know, and I originally started playing music and writing music because I wanted to be in a band. But what I'm finding is that, um, a lot of times people are really fucking flaky you know, if you want something done, <laughs> there's one person you can usually count on. <laughs> you know, and and I know I know it's not that I'm opposed to it, but at the same time, if it's something that I can do myself, I usually do it myself because I know that I'm going to do my very best and I'm going to get it done in the amount of time that I want it done, which is usually yesterday. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> do you find that um, when you're getting into music and stuff now, I know um, there's a lot of people that use like 
um, music as therapy, like there's music therapy and art therapy and things like that. Do you find that um, when you're getting into your music, you find that it's a therapeutic tool? Absolutely. Um, music absolutely saved my life more, more than once. Um, having that release and that form of expression, um, cause I've been, I'm a writer too. Um, I, I started writing probably about 14 years old and mm-hmm. it's just, there's such a freedom to it, you know, that it's just, there's nothing else like it. There really isn't. Um, when you can find your, your, your craft, you know, something that you're passionate about that, that when you're doing it, you're able to lose yourself in it. And that's, that's what I love about doing music and writing music and producing it is that I can let everything else go and just, you know, just completely immerse myself into what I'm doing. And, Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, the process of it for me is, is I enjoy finding those places where I'm completely vulnerable and it's okay to be that. And it's like a photograph in an instance, like, you know, I have a song that is literally, a, it's, it's about one brief moment, just one brief little moment, you know, this nine minute long song, but it's, it's, you know, being able to document to a degree, document these feelings and the emotions and, and being able to take something so personal um, that's completely from you and your feelings on something and then generalizing it and making it to where anyone can relate to it. And um, I think that's one of the, the beauties of, of art, it, it, you know, just, just art period, you know, whether it be whatever form it be, whether it's, you know, a brush or a, a, an instrument or a camera, you know, I think that um, that's really what makes art timeless is when someone can find that, that's something that's so raw and, and personal, but then generalize it to where someone can be listening to that or look at that and say, that person painted about my life or that person painted that, or, you know, that song's about me. Like I've heard, you know, throughout the years, several people say that not, not necessarily about my music, but just about a song in general, like, you know, this song, I could have written this song or this song's you know, what's going on in my life right now. And, you know, in my opinion and experience, that's really what, um, draws people to it and makes it timeless. Yeah, I totally agree. I've definitely said that myself. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> I've totally said that myself. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, if people went to the Reverb Nation, do you have a specific song that you would like them to to check out first? One that's like uh, most meaningful to you? <laughs> uh, Connor's choice pretty good um no you know they're all different you know like it's kind of the way i look at my songs are they're like my children and you know just like people each one of them has their own needs their own personalities and you know like some songs need more attention than others being like a big production a big to do as where some songs are just quiet and they just want you know one acoustic guitar track and maybe two or three vocal tracks and that's it you know what I mean? Um, I mean, I have my personal favorites, but, you know, there is one that's, that's pretty good. It's a pretty rough version of it, um, but it's still listenable. Is, I mean, again, this is all me, you know, learning by the seat of my pants how to use a computer. Because five years ago, I was computer illiterate, you know. Um, but I've taught myself how to use these, these programs. And, and so it's kind of a rough version, but it's called um, To Be With You. And it's kind of a song about, uh, it's a dark love song is what it is about these dark, you know, love stories like Mickey and Mallory Knox is our referenced and, uh, you know, Sid and Nancy and, and, uh, you know, Clarence in Alabama from true romance, you know, those are all referenced in that song. (laughs) What's that? I said, Oh, my favorite. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I'm also um, I'm scoring I'm scoring pure turn turn this either also. Oh I mean, really? Oh cool. Yeah. Is yeah, that something so you've ever done before? Actually, um, no, but it's been a dream of mine since I started writing music because of, I'm a film lover to begin with. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I've always been a big fan of of you know those two art forms together, the visual and the auditory together. Um, I've always been a big fan, 
And, you know, I've heard a lot about my music from a lot of people that it's very much sounds like it belongs in a film, you know, and I've, I've realized that over the last couple of years of writing and, and working on it, that like, you know, I really have an ear for that kind of music that even without the visual in your mind, you're still getting this picture painted. You know, it has that kind of that depth to it. Um, so this is huge for me being able to score, score it myself, because I mean, in my opinion, again, it goes back to who would be better to match up, you know, an emotion with audio and, and well, with the visual, you know what I mean? It's like, who could do that better than me? you know, for this right. particular project. Yeah. And then your, you know, your voice really permeates throughout the whole, the whole uh, project. Yeah. 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 I'm excited. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, this is basically my, you know, I'm very humbled. This is my dream coming true. This is something that I've wanted to do my whole life. Not only have I wanted to advocate and help other little children and little boys out there to um, get past this and become survivors but I've always wanted to, you know, share my music with everybody. You know, there's a song on Reverb Nation called, um, I think it's you, you or me, you and mine. And uh, that's what that song was written about is, is how weird it is to be a songwriter. Um, because again, like I said, it's taking something so personal. That's all you. And then, you know, it's like you want to just share it with everybody. So having this opportunity is, you know, I'm just every day, I'm, I'm just so grateful and humbled to have this opportunity and to try to make the most of it, you know, to utilize what I've got and um, help as many people as I can to do my part. Mm. Well, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure to have you on tonight. Yeah. Right thank on. you right so on. much. It's been awesome talking to you guys. Oh, Chop yeah. it up. Yeah. We'd love to have you back can't sometime. To... Uh, yeah. When the movie's uh, about to come out. Yeah. I can't okay. wait to see it. All right. I'm looking forward I to know it. it's, it's going to be good. I'm telling you, Connor's Connor's a brilliant guy and he's got a lot of great ideas. Um, and he's easy to work with, you know, like we can just sit here and it's a total just, you know, I mean, that's what it is. It's just me and him and we're just getting this shit done and, and doing something that we want to see that, you know, and that's what's mm-hmm. important. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, if you've got more going on with, uh, we are the boys, you know, let us know. Absolutely. I will. Yeah. I've got, I've got a friend of mine and she's just constant at work at it every day, just trying to promote it and, uh, and share it. And like, she's really the power behind that right now. So I'm really grateful to have her too, because it's, it's a big help. It's able, it's enabled me to focus on the project at hand with Connor and to get this Mm -hmm. underway. Um, so yeah, big shout out to all the people out there that are supporting and helping. Thank you so much. It's invaluable and we're all, you know, we're all doing our part to uh, make this all happen. So again, I thank everybody for their support continued and, and everything that they've uh, put into it, you know? Very cool. Thanks, man. I really appreciate you being on. Yeah, me too. I appreciate you guys having me on and um, we'll definitely do it again. Yeah. Don't be a stranger. All right. That (laughs) sounds great. Uh, Thanks so much for being on. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Hello, my friends. I am Fabio Frizzi, and we are listening to Without Your Head Radio.